Hello, everyone. We're about to get started. I'm your session MC, and my name is Ariana Santiago. This session is being live captioned. Heidi Winkler is our chat manager, and she's here to help. And we'll now drop a link to the shared community notes document, our code of conduct, and an email address where you can reach out for conference support. I invite you to use the chat to say hello and introduce yourselves and where you're joining from. Please feel free to use the chat to ask questions and share comments and resources throughout today's presentation. You may also ask for assistance in chat or ask questions anonymously by messaging your moderator, uh, Heidi Winkler. We'll have time at the end for Q&A and we'll save your questions for our speaker until then. So welcome again to day two of the Open Texas 2022 conference. My name is Ariana Santiago. I'm the OER coordinator at the University of Houston, and I'll be emceeing our first keynote session. I'm pleased to introduce today's keynote speaker, Jasmine Roberts Cruz. Jasmine Roberts Cruz is a lecturer in the School of Communication at The Ohio State University, where she teaches in the areas of public relations writing, digital activism, and campaign strategy. Her advocacy work centers on the experiences of people of color, women, and queer communities. Along with her communication expertise, Professor Roberts Cruz is also a renowned open education leader. She's delivered numerous keynote presentations across the country on the topics of inclusion and social justice in open education. She's the author of the openly licensed book, Writing for Strategic Communication Industries. In her spare time, she loves to connect with her wife, her fur babies, who are two dogs, and green babies, of which she has 50 plants total. Thank you all for joining us today, and now I'll pass it over to you, Jasmine. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'll go ahead and share my screen. These wonderful slides that I have for you all. I hope you are doing well. Thank you so much, Ariana, for that warm introduction. Um, please let Heidi or someone else know um, if you are unable to see my slides, please, please let them know, excuse me, so that you all are able to see them. So day two of Open Texas or the Open Texas Conference, I am so, so, so uh, pleased to be here. Um, this is just really, really exciting for me. I'm happy to kick off day two um, with you all. You'll have some really good sessions today. I'm kind of disappointed that I won't be able to attend some of them. Um, a few, I think, that are relevant that come to mind. I was looking through the schedule today that are relevant to some of the issues that I'll be talking about in my keynote. Um, there's one, visible and invisible labor, building a sustainable um, OER program. Actually, I think that takes place tomorrow, but that's, that's a really cool session that um, I'm hoping some of you all will be able to attend. Equal Partners uh, session put on by folks at UT Austin. I'll be talking talking about some of those issues that I think they'll be discussing in more detail. And then faculty perspectives on open educational uh, practices also takes place today, along with so many other sessions. So definitely looking forward to, to that. And then speaking of sessions, y'all, um, there is sort of a uh, debrief session about this keynote that I'll be delivering today. I think it takes place around noon or so central time, one um, Eastern time that I unfortunately will not be able to be there because I have to teach. Um, however, I do have some questions that I want you all to kind of like uh, grapple with and consider during your discussion. So it would be really nice if you can send me an email or a message somehow and give me feedback on how the key uh, the keynote went for you and just some of the things that you all discussed in that debrief session. So I mentioned some of the sessions earlier um, uh, for Open Texas. My keynote will not cover all of the issues that you all will perhaps um, cover in some of the smaller sessions related to labor and open education. So I certainly encourage you to attend some of those sessions that are more directly to directly related to some of the things that you all are are kind of you know um, thinking about and what have you. 
And then also I view being a keynote as a, a guide, right? So um, I am not all knowing on all of the issues related to labor in open education. I'm just like you all, uh, again, really trying to wrestle with some of these issues, especially since a lot of these issues are very systemic and structural in nature. Um, and you know, I've just been placed into a wonderful position to where I can elevate awareness of these issues so that we can have a more fruitful discussion about labor in, in open education. So before I uh, officially begin my keynote, um, I, I usually, or I wanna say that I usually begin my talks with a territory acknowledgement, um, but I, I've really been listening to indigenous people and I'm learning that sometimes a territory acknowledgement can um, come across as performative, um, that meaning, you know, there's no action behind the words. So until I figure out how to do a territory acknowledgement properly, I want to instead acknowledge the ongoing injustices that have happened to so many Indigenous communities and how universities across the nation still benefit from these injustices to this day. So um, a study or a project that I reference a lot at the beginning of my talks that usually follows my territory acknowledgements is a project called the Land Grab University Project. Some of you all might have heard of this. Um, and so it was spearheaded by, or it was created by journalist uh, Tristan Autown and historian Bobby Lee, where they spent a couple of years essentially tracking how 11 million acres of land were taken from more than 200 um, indigenous pro uh, tribes and communities to help fund land grant institutions in the 19th century. And so more specifically, they looked at the Morrill Act of 1862 in particular and how it helped to create a massive transfer of wealth from indigenous lands to university endowments. So um, we can kind of see how, for example, the financial success of uh, Texas A&M University was paid by the expropriation of indigenous land and settler colonialism. So it's really important for us to connect again, indigenous lands to the foundation of public universities beyond you know, a mere territory acknowledgement. And so I, don't, I definitely wanted to do that in, in kind of a response from some of the discourse I've been hearing from um, those ind indigenous communities. So this is a transitioning into my, my keynote this is a really interesting keynote to deliver, to be honest with you, given the very timely conversation we are having about um, labor, not only in academia, but also across the nation. If we consider some of these issues from a variety of perspectives, but of course I'm coming from the faculty perspective, we are seeing so many um, resigning from their academic uh, positions and leaving for industry or doing something else beyond you know, those two uh, sectors, if you will. And I think the pandemic brought, um, brought about a great deal of um, uh, self-reflection and assessment from so many individuals, like questions like, why am I doing this? <laughs> or or how, how should I be spending my time, my limited time here on earth, right? I think, I think all of this is driving, you know, the great resignation trends that we keep hearing about. Um, but to be quite honest with you, that have probably started before the pandemic, but certainly accelerated it because of the social, economic, and health conditions that so many of us found ourselves in. So there's a couple of um, surveys that I kind of want to uh, put out to you all that I've been reading about. So in uh, this year, in 2022, uh, Inside Higher Ed uh, put out a survey and they found that 20% of the nation's provosts reported how faculty are leaving their institutions at very higher rates than before. And then 60% of the nation's provost said that faculty are leaving at somewhat higher rates than what was reported before. So it's still <laughs> not a good look, right? Um, and even students um, are noticing how so many faculty and staff um, are, are burnt out and just plain over it over the culture of academia um, that you know positions us to be charged to do so much, but with so little, right? 
And so another inside higher ed uh, survey that I'm, I'm considering and thinking about, this was a survey where they particularly partnered with um, College Pulse. And they found that students are seeing, like literally seeing professors uh, burnt out and that's affecting their, their, their classroom environment. And it's not just faculty, staff as well. There are other higher education professionals who are working closely with students, for example, or with faculty, and they're experiencing some of the same trends. So according to NASPA, which stands for the National Association of Student Personnel um, Administrators in 2022 or 2021, excuse me, um, student professionals or student affair professionals um, who resigned reported, you know, some of the reasons that they resigned. And those reasons included, you know, non-competitive wages, increased burnout, and just this overall perception that their work was not valued, that there wasn't a, a general appreciation um, for staff. And so I give you all that context that we are all in, right, um, to kind of illustrate that in, in our community in open education, um, we are kind of grappling with the same issues, right, because we don't operate in some sort of vacuum or isolated from these issues. Um, you know, the discussions about labor, you know, in the workplace and the work environment and the culture um, that we're trying to cultivate in open education, all of those discussions I do want to acknowledge have taken place even before the pandemic as well. So, for example, we've had discussions regarding how we compete against, and again, I use that word hesitantly, but we compete against traditional academic publishers or publishing models and content creation uh, platforms where essentially they are marketing convenience to educators instead of trying to make them a better educator. That's something that you'll hear me say a lot. Um, and so there's a real question of labor right, that I think traditional publishers are, are trying to use as a, a marketing strategy, right, so making the labor process easier, more convenient, um, if you will, for um, faculty and educators. And there are other uh, issues related to labor and education that we are wrestling with. So I was really inspired by Mahabali's approach to creating keynotes. And I love um, kind of what she says here in a keynote that she delivered last year at my home institution that while keynotes appear like it's one individual who has all the right answers and this is just their work, it's actually inspired by a lot of people. This really is communal labor here. And so with that approach, I kind of you know, took to Twitter to ask people, what are some of the issues that they're thinking about as it relates to um, you know, labor and open education and some of the concerns, right, that we have, that we have to, to address. And so what I'd like us to do before I show you all some of those responses, I'd like you all in the audience to maybe take three minutes to consider one or more of the questions that I have written here on the slides. And those questions read, what does labor and open education mean to you? Uh, when you think of the politics of labor and open ed, what issues surface and what more do we need to discuss? Perhaps what is something that we're not discussing or something that we have, but we need to circle back to. So yes, I wanna give you all about three minutes just to kind of you know think about that. And then once you're done, perhaps put your answers in the chat so that we can kind of um, have a moment to elevate some of those issues. <laughs> 
I'm still going to give folks a few more minutes to um, think about some of these things, but I know there are already some answers coming in, but yes, I'll go ahead and mute myself for maybe another minute and then we'll go through some of the responses. All right, so we have a lot of responses coming in. I just kind of want to read through um, some of them that we have. So someone put adjuncts are not paid for course development time. It must be acknowledged that utilizing publishers content maximizes their hourly compensation. Absolutely. So here we have a highly marginalized population that's engaging in this labor in open education, right? But what does that actually mean and how do we support this highly marginalized community? And thank you so much to that individual who um, highlighted that because that's actually some of the things that I'm going to go into in just a second in terms of the adjunctification in higher ed and how um, we see that a lot in within our own community in open education, right? So thank you so much for that. Someone put the inequity of compensation for work done by early adopters prior to any formal faculty compensation structure being enacted. Absolutely. That is certainly an issue, the inequity of compensation for work done. Someone else put balancing FOMO, <laughs> exhaustion, absolutely. And the need to have my name well known enough to get in the room, right? Why, why is it that we have to do all this labor to even um, have our voices heard, right? Um, I think we need to interrogate that process and where does that process come from? And conversely, choosing to stay out of the room, right? When others' voices should be present and heard rather than mine. So that balance, right, between, you know, when do I step into the room? What do I need to do in order to get into the room? And then maybe this room is not for me, right? This is not the space for me. So I really appreciate that individual voicing that as well. Someone else put the amount of invisible and emotional labor in open ed. Yes, I will talk about that as well in the keynote. Um, especially as it intersects with um, other work that is coming into our community that highlights some of the structural and systemic inequities within higher ed, right? So in other words, sometimes while we try to present open ed as a practice and as a value, a philosophy, as something radically different from some of the traditional norms within higher ed, unfortunately, we kind of see how we reproduce those, those um, values and norms and some of those systemic inequities as well, because we're, again, not operating in a vacuum. So appreciate that point as well. Librarians, who are my favorite people, <laughs> adding this work to their duties, in addition to existing responsibility without extra support, nor or, or uh, uh, compensation, uh, compensation here, yes. Right, so imagining, you know, how can we imagine open as central to one's work, right, rather than an ancillary, I'll talk about that as well, but how do we realistically do that and within this larger structure. I um, just want to go through a few more here. I need more education for open education. What can I compare it to so that I may understand how will it affect the students. Will they really save money? If at some point students can go to school for free, will this improve opportunities, right? The outcomes for open education and all it offers. What will fund this? Absolutely, absolutely. And then someone else put the lack of recognition for creating OER work within this broader academic structure that has a very, I would say specific, um, and I would even argue, this is just my, my you know, philosophy on this, kind of a narrow way of creating knowledge 
uh, affirming whose knowledge is valuable um, and, and reliable, right? Um, so I appreciate that person's point in terms of the lack of recognition and why is it that that takes place, right? There's a reason why, because certain norms and values are centered within higher ed, within academia. And I think the process of creating OERs um, or even publishing open access journals kind of undermines some of those more traditional norms. Disproportionate impacts on groups doing labor and visibility of labor and who is doing it. Yep, so I'm seeing compensation still come up. Um, there's a lack of recognition for OER for PNT promotion and tenure for those who don't know that absolutely, and a lot of that is driven by outdated paradigms. Yep. So basically, what I just said here, very good. And then people, this last point that I want to go ahead and, and talk about, people tend to view morally good projects in OER and DEI as intrinsically motivated and extracurricular, so that they are not compensated similarly to other more uh, traditional areas. Yes, absolutely. This was great, y'all. Thank you so much for that. So I will be hitting on some of these issues that you all have voiced, um, actually a lot of them in, in some capacity. So absolutely. Let me go ahead and go to my next slide here and uh, tell you all what were some of the responses I received from Twitter from our um, community. So Ash put a labor in open ed immediately makes me think about the difficulties associated with adding OER or OEP duties to an already very full role as a librarian instead of creating dedicated OER and OEP librarian roles where the work can truly or really thrive, right? So I think that basically supports a lot of what you all were saying in the chat, especially when we're talking about the labor that librarians do the fact that there's already a set of responsibilities that are expected. And then on top of that, we're adding this very emotionally um, um, and just intellectually laborious um, uh, responsibilities that come with working in open ed on top of the day-to-day -day responsibilities that so many librarians have and not having the human resources or capital in place to have perhaps a dedicated role for an OER librarian, as Ash pointed out here. Abby put a couple of things come to mind, the labor of instructors, whether the work they do preparing teaching materials, open or otherwise, is actually valued, right? Open education profession professionals, excuse me, whether their work supporting OE as a standalone project or folding into an existent one. And then some other people responded, Abby again continues to go on to highlight IT professionals who I know are, are currently in the room right now, managing and sustaining platforms and services for long-term use hosting open source platforms, whether those orgs will uh, fund that labor and outsources or outsource it, excuse me. And then we have to consider students, right? So are we actually supporting student authors doing open pedagogy and ensuring that they are educated properly on copyrights? And that in and of itself constitutes labor, right? So how do we communicate labor in open education to staff, to faculty, and to students, right? So while open pedagogy, there's a lot of joy, at least in my opinion, that comes with participating in open pedagogy, that students can be creators of knowledge. How do we educate them on the labor that comes with that, that creation? And then uh, Maha put here, definitely, so talking more about librarians and instructional designers and technologists, she goes on to say, if it's their job, their name and opinion, um, you know, they aren't central to the intellectual property conversations. So when we concede creators to go OER, we are university resources that give the institution rights, right? So again, this tension between intellectual property, institution rights, and, you know, wanting to make sure that we give credit where credit is essentially due. And then someone else put, the current university system is a growing gig economy that divides and fractures. So all of us in this learning experience are uh, increasingly removed and disempowered. Again, faculty, librarian, IT students, and staff. The answer to this problem is communication organization. How do we exactly do that? Yes. And so as you can see, many, many, many of us are kind of, again, thinking about the same issues, um, you know, and again, a lot of these issues that you all kind of notice here 
are, are very structural and systemic in nature. So for me, when I got the responses on Twitter and I was preparing for this keynote, um, you know, filtering through all the responses made me really consider the assumptions um, that we make about labor and open education. The, you know, for example, the expectations and beliefs we hold and how, um, you know, that in and of itself informs how and what we do in our community. So the notion of assumptions that, you know, uh, or this notion of assumptions, excuse me, is actually what's driving um, a lot of the questions that I'm asking in my keynote with you all this morning. And some of those questions are basically very plain, plainly, what assumptions do we make about labor in open education, right? There's a lot, I think, that we make. And so as a result, how do we actually challenge those assumptions? And so my, my argument in, in today's keynote is that by interrogating these assumptions, we can better position our conversations about labor and open ed, um, which can, in my opinion, lead to more fruitful discussions about how to realistically address these issues. So in my keynote, I'm going to go over three assumptions that I see come up often in my work, whether you know individually or collaboratively. And these three assumptions are non-exhaustive lifts because I think we all, including myself, make certain assumptions about labor and open education. But I want to narrow it down to three. Um, and, and what does it mean when we make these assumptions, right? And so in the q and I'd like us to kind of discuss next steps going forward. Like, what are you all's thoughts about some of these assumptions and how do we, we challenge them going forward? So the first assumption that I want to go ahead and highlight here is that, you know, when we're talking about labor and open education, I think we assume that labor is just about labor, right? Um, but this morning, I, you know, I really argue that labor is almost rarely just about labor. Labor is an intersectional struggle and one that is not isolated from other forms of um, or other systems of oppression. Okay. Academic labor has always been intersectional, um, in which in turn reveals, as Kimberly Crenshaw uh, talks about and refers to as interlocking systems of oppression. So many OER practitioners are specifically marginalized in their roles and bring marginalized identities to their role, right? Which, you know, systems and institutions consequently devalue their, their work. And so in particular, just to give you all like specific examples, I think someone, you know, in the chat had brought this up as well. I'm particularly thinking of how many um, adopters of OERs are, for example, non-tenure faculty members, right, whether full-time or part-time. Uh, but this is a community that is particularly marginalized within the broader hierarchy of, of um, you know, academia, a community that I belong to as a full-time non-tenure faculty member at a R1 or research in intensive institution. And so, um, you know, while this community is highly marginalized within the academic structure, they're oftentimes the ones who are the most receptive <laughs> to open practices. Again, I'm saying this anecdotally. I don't know if there's a lot of research and literature out there uh, regarding that, which by the way, there should be. It's a research study idea. Um, but yeah, they're the most receptive uh, to using OER or more receptive, I should say, and, and, and em embodying and embracing open practices in their classroom. Since non-tenure faculty have more teaching intensive roles usually, um, and they're not on the tenure track, OERs can, not always, but can have more of an appeal. However, I think what I am uh, kind of considering here and have been for quite some time is how do we treat this community of non-tenure faculty or adjunct faculty um, that is sometimes and oftentimes the largest faculty community we interact with, right? How do we treat them with dignity, respect, care, and equity? Okay. How do we, for example, um, pay, right? So we talked about compensation a little bit earlier. Someone mentioned that. How do we pay these adjunct and non-tenure faculty members equitably for their contributions? And I say equitably on purpose, right? So given the, the, the resources, the time, and the marginalization that this community goes through, how do we make sure that their compensation is equitable? Um, more importantly, also another thing to consider is what is the expectation Right. 
for such contributions from a highly marginalized community when quite frankly, some of these individuals don't even have office space to have office hours with their students, okay? As um, one of my, my dear colleagues, Dr. Heather Maselli, um, one of her responses to my original tweet, she talks about the adjunctification of higher ed and um, she, she argues that it comes into play here when we're talking about labor and open education with the expectations of adopting or creating OER ever increasing. So this adds extra work to people teaching many courses likely at several institutions making very little in wages to make it work. Again, what is the ask of a highly marginalized population, a group that is often treated like second-class citizens within higher education academia? Another group that comes to mind in this discussion about how labor is almost always not just <laughs> about labor are my rock star librarians. It's truly, I love y'all. I really, really do. The sheer amount of work that librarians do for us in this community is absolutely, absolutely amazing. And yet at the same time, we expect so much from this group, right? We expect them to understand licenses perfectly, consult with faculty um, or consult faculty with, you know, about OERs, be experts on publishing, just to name a few, right? That's a lot to, to expect out of, out of a community. And so Heather goes on to kind of talk about this in one of her responses. Um, another thing that she thinks of when she considers the issues of labor and open education is the ever expanding roles of, of um, you know, especially in librarians and thinking how this could be applied to other positions as well, where OER is added to their already full plate of work and the push for OER can be strong with high expectations, little support to make a miracle happen basically. Um, but you know, there's something else to know in that uh, librarians in the OER space are disproportionately women or femmes. And so herein lies a, um, a reoccurring theme in the academy, right, of how work done by women or femmes is often invisible and undervalued. Yet these same women and femmes are more likely to be overworked than their other gender counterparts. And this is even more pronounced and precarious for women of color who experience multiple sites of oppression at the same time due to their racialized and gendered identities. And so I believe um, another tweet kind of brings this to light as well. Dr. Um, Maya uh, Hay, as she talks about how, when she thinks about labor in open education, she thinks about the unpaid, unacknowledged and undervalued labor, usually by folks in already precarious positions, people of color, early career graduate student. Lately, she's been thinking about how labor, how the labor of open ed is on top of her labor as researcher, instructor, mentor, but they are just one person. So uh, kind of elaborating more on this point, if we, if we look at conversations about social justice, for instance, in education more broadly, women of color are leaders in this area. Their work uh, enriches all of our work and understanding of how to make education more socially just. And you know, oftentimes they are engaging in social justice work to survive right, a system that continues to marginalize their experiences in and outside of their, their role at the institution. Yet women of color who are kind of leading the way in social justice and equity work, they are in very precarious situations for calling out the very systems that oppress them, for doing the work that they were actually hired to do and with very little protection to do so. So we also have to consider the differing risk of doing um, such work in open ed. And I talk about this as well in some of my other talks and writing, depending upon who exactly is doing the labor. So although the labor is very intense for all of us, it doesn't necessarily show up the same way. It doesn't manifest the same way because of our various different um, identities that we bring into the role. Another article that I refer to often when I talk about this, you know, issue of intersect intersectionality within labor and open education is um, this article titled Affirming Our Values. And it's by um, doctors uh, Stephen Finley, Biko Gray, and Lori Martin. And they discuss the particular vulnerability that faculty of color in particular 
and sometimes staff of color, but they mostly focus on faculty um, that they face in doing their work, especially if the work is related to social justice, race, or uh, race related or gender related issues. And so in their article, they even talk about how there are some cases in which faculty of color um, and staff of color have um, received violent threats from people and, and towards their loved ones. So this, this is real life, this, this stuff happens. And so on top of the egregious risk in doing social justice work, Black and Latina women in particular are less cited right, um, for their work and are more likely to have their expertise called into question. So all of this, of course, is intentional by design. If we look at how higher education um, or why higher education existed in the first place and what norms and values are, are centered and are currently centered, I should say that, um, and embodied. So all of this also leads me to kind of a sub question um, that is directly related to our community here in open education. How do we protect women of color in the open education community doing work that puts them in precarious situations in academia? How do we actually do that? Does that look like allyship? What does that actually look like? Does that look like advocacy? What does that look like? And I don't know the specific answers to that to be quite transparent with you, but it is something that is, uh, should be our priority within our community. And so the second assumption that I kind of want to delve into is that we assume that open education has to kind of fit into, um, you know, uh, academic traditions and, and norms in order to be successful rather than making an argument for how open ed actually illustrates what's wrong <laughs> with the system. And I know a lot of us in the room, we're already, we've already drank the Kool-Aid, you know, we, we already know that open ed radically, uh, or is a radical alternative, if you will, to some of the things that we're seeing in academia and some of the academic uh, structures, if you will. But I really, really like this point that another colleague of mine, Karen, I just love, love Karen, um, you know, her response to my tweet was, you know, she's thinking about when, you know, questioning the labor of open always makes her think more broadly about the work that we do as educators. What is the work um, that we should, what is the work, excuse me, that we should be doing anyway? Why is open often considered ancillary to our more important work? Um, maybe we can stop thinking of our work in open as an add-on. And so, of course, you all know Karen is going to be your keynote for tomorrow. So I'm hoping she elaborates uh, a bit more on that. But her, her, her response to that just really inspired this second assumption that I think a lot of us make. And that honestly did kind of show up in some of the responses to my questions earlier, right? And so I want to make sure that I'm treading very carefully here because the issues that you all are addressing in your responses are real, right? And so, um, yes, I definitely want to acknowledge that. And in the same vein, I think this is an opportunity for open education or the uh, philosophy and essence of open, if you will, to continue, right? To continue asking questions in the broader scope of higher ed, whose knowledge is valuable, for example. We ask that question a lot in open ed. Who do we center, right? Um, why do we center certain work and as a result, marginalize other works? If we take, for instance, the peer review process in academia, Scholars note how, you know, the traditional peer review process in academia tends to center a very white Western approach to epistemology or um, creating knowledge, right, or the knowledge creation process. However, as many of us know, open access publishing has the potential to not only broaden the impact of our research and our work, but also provides another perhaps um, more egalitarian way of engaging in knowledge creation. Again, I'm going to put an asterisk by that because there are some nuances that we have to consider, right, with open access. Um, so we also know um, that, unfortunately, you know, there are some scholars and institutions that seem to be punished for promoting a more open way or um, promoting open access uh, publishing, uh, punished through financial costs, right? So it Oftentimes, institutions have to bear a steep financial cost. Um, scholars sometimes have to, to bear that cost as well, not only 
that, but also reputational costs. So this is something I'll never get used to, to be honest with you, uh, as an educator and as a scholar. So my point in all of this to bring this up is to say that this is an opportunity to call out these systems and demonstrate how open education, in some cases, better assists higher education institutions in their goal in trying to actually make education more accessible and equitable. And so while it is definitely important for us to consider the current traditions, right? So someone mentioned earlier p and that is, I would say, one of the biggest barriers that we see in terms of faculty embracing open as a philosophy because of the reward structure. Um, the customs, the systems that make up higher ed, we have to definitely grapple with that and, and understand that those that that's real, right? But I think sometimes, you know, um, when we're in a situation where we feel like open is automatically ancillary instead of baked into the work that we do in higher ed, I think that further marginalizes our labor because of how we're even approaching the conversation, right? If that makes any sense. So I'm just wondering for me, like, you know, and for everyone else who's listening in, like what, what would it look like, right? For open as a philosophy and as a practice to be centered in your work? What, what would that actually look like? And what would that take for that to actually um, come to fruition? So for me as an educator, that looks like, again, asking those questions that we ask a lot in open ed, um, inviting students um, into the knowledge creation process, right? Making sure that my work is accessible, things of that sort. For me, that's, that's a bare minimum, right? And so later on in the Q&A, if we do have time, I'd like us to really kind of figure out what, what would that look like in our labor for open to not be ancillary to it for the essence of it, uh, open, if you will, to be centered in our work. And so the last, um, I guess you can say assumption <laughs> that I wanna talk about in the keynote this morning is, you know, while I just basically developed an argument of how we should use the philosophy of open to interrogate these more traditional norms and systems within higher ed, at the same time, you know, um, we assume that open ed is an absolute disruptor that ushers in systemic change for the academy. More specifically, we assume that um, we seem we assume that since we are doing this for the greater good, right? Many of us are doing this work because we want to see change. Um, but we assume that since we're doing this work for the greater good, that everyone participating in this labor is um, acting in good faith. Um, you know, but we also have to, to, to challenge ourselves and look within to see if we are actually upholding some of the values that we, we say that we um, are a part of our community. So we, we see this issue in how writers and authors who do work for some open education organizations, there are unfortunately instances when um, people are not actually being credited for their work that they're doing, but instead the work is being rebranded as uh, the organization's work, right? So my response to this is, how is this practice upholding our alleged values within open education? What is to be said about organizations doing open ed work that uh, asserts that they want to bring about um, systemic change in the name of access and equity, but are also engaging in inequitable practices which result in unjust outcomes. So also thinking about that, how this is even more demoralizing and undermining of our values when it comes to the work being done in open education as it relates to DEI and social justice. So this is a space where, again, we're talking about justice and how it intersects with um, open ed and as well as equity and inclusion and diversity. We claim, for example, we stand for justice. We claim we stand for equity. We claim we stand for diversity and inclusion, but yet, and this is not applicable to every single organization that's doing open work, but there are some real issues that we have to address directly. Um, yet some of our practices might point to something different, right? So there are instances at some uh, organizations within um, our open ed community where once more people of color are doing tremendously you know, good work in this space, excellent work, right? 
um, but they are not receiving proper credit. Uh, their work is being rebranded as the organization without any mentioning of their specific contributions. And so um, I'm also thinking about how it, the same, you know, people of color uh, report to gatekeepers who only believe in diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in statements or for idealistic or altruistic uh, purposes and not through change behaviors and, and practices, right? So for me, all of this reinforces the notion of how open education labor can sometimes be positioned in white saviorhood rather than justice. Um, that there are scholars of color and, and other individuals who have already done this work, who've already created the blueprint for this work. And yet, um, you know, there are, um, yet there are some like white scholars and practitioners who are being credited for saving disadvantaged communities that are sometimes disproportionately communities of color. This strips away the autonomy and, you know, not to mention it does nothing to actually address the structural and systemic issues at play. And so, for example, um, one of the things that I uh, have mentioned a lot that how we can correct this is that we have to correct our historical discourses in the field and acknowledge that open education is rooted in black feminist thought and other frameworks that come from scholars from marginalized backgrounds. And so an article that I, I often you know, cite and refer to, uh, Marco Seiferle, Valencia, uh, argued a couple of years ago that conventional histories and scholarly contextualizations of open uh, movements do not connect open pedagogy to liberatory women of color, feminist proxy and, and, and scholarship on education. So in other words, Marco is basically arguing that open education, the philosophy, the framework, the ideologies are nothing new, right? Um, the notion of interrogating inst institutional frameworks, policies, and procedures, putting forth those questions whose knowledge is valuable. The idea of openness essentially is rooted in Black feminism or Black feminism uh, uh, liberation. So failing to make this connection, especially once you're aware of it, reinforces the practice of failing to acknowledge and cite the incredible work um, done by BIPOC scholars or scholars of color and how this influences our broader work here. So when it comes to making sure that our work is actually, you know, living up to our alleged values through practice, right, especially if we look at the intersections between open education, social justice, and equity, we also have to be careful of not um, expediting these efforts for the sake of looking, looking like we care, right, <laughs> instead of actually caring through practice. So remember, to care is an action, right, not just something that makes you, you feel good. And speaking of care, um, I do want to also refer to a framework that I'm using a lot of my, in, in my work when I talk about open ed and, and social justice. Mahabali, who I know I've referenced a lot now in my keynote, and Mia Zamora, they created a very useful framework arguing that, you know, equity and care need to come together if we actually want to do this work correctly, um, or at least uh, in a just way. I believe this framework has tremendous implications as we consider what does labor and open education actually mean, especially as it relates to how many of us are trying to figure out how to make open ed more equitable and more socially just. So in one of Maha's many keynotes, she explains how if you have equitable policies, but nobody cares, as is in the case in the left quadrant um, or left uh, top left quadrant, it can come across as contractual equity or, or performative, essentially. Um, also a situation, you know, you can have people who care, right? But the labor of doing social justice work is not distributed equitably or equally. So for example, when you have mostly people of color doing this labor, you only have partial care, um, which essentially is on the right, um, uh, lower right quadrant there. And then they're not being cited for that work. Wow, that's really not care. <laughs> um, when we have systemic, you know, or we don't have systemic um, equity, right? Um, and there's no care at all, then we have systemic injustice, and which is at the bottom uh, left quadrant there. So essentially bringing this up to say, we want socially just care. Um, that's, that's what we want. We want that in our labor and open education. So the top right-hand quadrant there. 
And I love this quote from Maha um, where she talks about how it's not it's not just important to plan a process that is equitable or uh, socially just when we're thinking about labor, but also we have to think about the people that are contributing to it and we have to think about it with care, right, and, and making it work. And Mia also talks about, she's quoted as stating that equity might be the outcome that we seek in our work, but care, right, is the process that we need to use. And I'm going to add on to that to say that for many of us who are doing this labor, many of us got into this because, you know, we do care or because we were very frustrated with uh, things that we are seeing, whether it's the inequities that we were seeing or the impact of uh, so many policies on students and faculty and staff. But frustration and concern alone does not sustain this labor in open education, right? So drawing on Bell Hook's argument that she presented in her well-known book, All About Love, she talks about how all the great social movements for freedom and justice are rooted in a love ethic. And I add on to that and I say that frustration and concern might spark your reasoning for why you got started in the first place in open ed or even care, but love is what's really going to sustain this labor. And so to essentially end and conclude my, my keynote this morning, um, I'm of the belief that until we address some of these systemic issues that harm academic labor, for example, which work is valued, which work is as a result marginalized, um, just in general, the intense marginalization that goes on in higher ed, I am unsure, and I say that word intentionally, um, I'm unsure if, if our conversations about labor and open ed can truly progress because again, these, these issues are so intersectional. They're so intertwined with one another, right? Um, these issues, again, are not isolated from, you know, the work that we're doing in open education. And as I stated earlier in my talk, you know, we have the potential to show how open education provides a radical, more compassionate alternative to academic labor that we typically see in higher education, but only if we can, you know, actually uphold some of those values that we say that we have within our community. So I leave you with a few more things to consider, and they're, they're kind of on this slide here. So think about how you can make your labor more radical to confront systemic injustices and inequities. That will take time. <laughs> how can we be more okay with the fact that the labor that we're doing is personal? There's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, how do we make our labor more communal, right? How do we make it more service-minded? And again, how do we make it more revolutionary? So I'm really looking forward to having, see, it looks like I've talked for a lot longer than I thought, but <laughs> I want to go ahead and have maybe a brief discussion over that. And with that, I kind of kind of end here. Thank you all so much for, for listening to me. There's my contact information. Please, let's, let's go ahead and have just this brief discussion. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for that fantastic keynote. Thank you. We'll, we'll transition now. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, we'll transition into Q&A for the remaining time that we have. And the Q&A is being recorded. So if you'd like to ask an anonymous question, you can do so through that Q&A feature. So let's take a look at our first question from Anna. And I do invite Anna to clarify this question in the chat if needed in case I've misinterpreted it. Um, Anna says, the, um, the great resignation trend and the, the pandemic opened doors to opportunities that were not considered or imagined. For example, mm -hmm. some folks may have gained opportunities during the pandemic that were positive career-wise, like sure. new opportunities to teach. So what are some of the causes for burnout or things to watch out for so we can avoid burnout? Uh, that's a great question because I'm trying to figure that out myself. Well, I do want to acknowledge that Anna makes a good point in terms of, you know, two things can be true at the same time, right? So while for uh, some of us, the pandemic, um, and, and again, I want to be conscious of my words, the pandemic is still going on for many of us. I know a lot of us want to leave it behind, but it's still going on. Uh, the pandemic was a particularly egregious time for a lot of us. For some of us, um, it 
it was tough, but there were some positive things that came from it, right? Um, so I really appreciate Anna's point in terms of like, you know, illustrating that two things can be true at the same time. In terms of um, avoiding burnout, and again, I also want to be cautious of how I answer this question because I think my answer comes with a certain sense of privilege, right? A position of pri pri privilege, excuse me. And I do want to acknowledge that. So one of the things that I've been kind of meditating on uh, to avoid burnout is the fact that I am realizing that rest is a radical practice. It is an act of resistance, especially if we're looking at the U.S. context in which one of our cultural norms is, you know, we value productivity, right? Go ahead and just, just turn it out, turn it out. Um, and with that it comes a very tough environment where you kind of have to think more intentionally about rest. And so all of that to say, you have to take rest. Rest is not going to be given to you. And so I think those are the things that I've been thinking about a lot in my work, right? That I am one person who's doing this work, that I need to lean on my community. Uh, Dr. Angela Davis talks about how for her self-care is communal care, right? The fact that her community invested in her and poured into her and that she does the same thing. And so I think that's another opportunity for us to avoid burnout is that really pouring into uh, the community or engaging in what we call communal care in that in that capacity. So that's a great question. I mean, I think that's something that a lot of us are trying to think about, like, how do we avoid burnout? I mean, I think just taking a day off or going to, you know, a vacation for a week, I'm not sure if that alone is going to help us to avoid uh, burnout, there really has to be a cultural change in how we look at rest, right? How we look at productivity and higher ed has to embody that, that cultural change uh, for sure. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> yeah. I think we all needed to hear that. Yeah. Okay. Don't next... feel guilty for taking a break. Yeah. I would say that. <laughs> For sure. Okay, our next anonymous question um, says, am I alone in the feeling that creating course materials like OER is just part of my job as a faculty member? This is why I'm here to drive education. Mm. I'm clearly missing something or viewing things differently. No, you're not alone. So if I'm hearing that question correctly, right? So this notion of, um, how do I wanna say this? Like, this, this, is, this is my, this is my job. And so um, I want to make sure I'm hearing this. So why would I feel like it's an uh, it's an add-on? I want to make sure I'm hearing that correctly. I'm not sure. Um, but I, I think you can still, you know, say, hey, this this is what my role is at the university, but also acknowledge that depending upon um, the the role in and of itself, depending upon what you're bringing to that role, the expectations can differ, right? Um, in terms of how I show up to that role versus how you might show up to that role, um, Ariana. So I think that is something that we do, we certainly need to consider. Um, and I think it's okay that even though, you know, it's someone's job that we can still interrogate certain expectations and responsibilities that come along with that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I see some other comments saying that this is a, a great question as well. Yeah. Uh, so our next one, I think, is in response to your question about what would it look like to center open or to yeah. center open education. So I think this is a, more of a comment, but it's a great one. Um, they say centering open would look like having one job and not three jobs. Hello. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. What? What? But you know, I think my you know, not to engage into engage in uh, imaginary futures too much, but like, you know, I, I think I'm interested in having conversations about like, what can, what does that look like practically and in a small way, right? And so I, I'm not trying to bring this up again, but when I said earlier, you have to take rest, right? Um, what would that, how would that help to make sure that we're not having five or six jobs in one role, right? How can we make that connection? But yeah, I am definitely an interest in having the conversations of what is this expectation that we have, that we have to do eight things in one role? Where does that come from, right? Well, how can we practically address that? Because so many of us are dealing with that right now. So many of us, 
Um, and it's it should not be normal. I think that's another thing, right? Um, on one hand, many of us feel alone, but then we talk about it, we feel affirmed that, okay, everyone else is going through this. But uh, just because something is common doesn't mean that it's normal. And uh, I think that's also something to consider as well as we think about labor and the expectations surrounding labor, specifically in open education. Yeah. So we're right at 11 a.m. Central Time. Um, Jasmine, um, if we have time for one more question, we can do one more. Um, it's up to you on timing, but there are so many great questions coming out. Oh, we gosh. Get all of them. <laughs> I do, unfortunately, you know, I do, unfortunately, have to take off to the ne next thing, but I do have my contact information out there, y'all. Roberts hyphen cruise dot one at OSU dot edu. Um, and then I am on Twitter at Prof Jasmine. So you can reach out to me through there. But um, you all have been so great. Um, this has been an amazing experience. And I do hope to maybe interact with many of you all on a, a smaller scale. So like I said, that we can actually kind of talk about these issues and what does that actually look like in practice. Yes, and I know there will be a keynote reflection session later on, so if we didn't get to your question, please feel free to bring those questions to that session. I'm sure it will generate a lot of fantastic discussion. Um, thank you so much, Jasmine, and thank you to everyone who attended today's keynote session. So we'll stop recording now um, and end the session. Thank you all again for coming. <laughs>